Welcome to Careers in Discovery, your window into the world of leaders in pharma and biotech. Brought to you by Singular Talent, making hiring better for organizations involved in drug discovery and R&D. This week, I am here with Valentino Paravicini of Oxford Cannabinoid Technologies. Valentino, welcome to Careers in Discovery. Oh, uh, thank you. You're, you're very welcome. And thank you, Tom. I'm really happy to be here and talk about myself and, and my work. Really looking forward to it. So we always start, Valentino, by talking a bit about what you're doing now. So can you yep. can you tell us a bit about OCT, about the endocannabinoid system and about yep. the work that you're doing? Sure. Yes. Um, uh, OCT or Oxford Cannabinoid Technologies, uh, as we know, it's a company uh, that went public um, in uh, May 2021. Mm hmm. Uh, the company is focusing on uh, generating the next generation of uh, uh, cannabinoids um, um, drug, which are based on small molecules. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not talking about the old cannabis plants. So we can have a discussion about that. We decided to go fully pharmaceutical. So developments of small molecules through the roots of development we normally use for an NC and a new chemical entity yes. uh, through the regulators. So uh, obviously R&D, preclinical development, and then clinical development so for, for all the regulators so that our drug uh, can, will be, of course, if science uh, supported us, mm -hmm. because, well, will be uh, entering the market through the regulators so can be prescribed and can be reimbursed um, yes. by the authority when, uh, when required. We are working again with uh, different input in terms of uh, cannabinoids. We have some mm -hmm. natural cannabinoids or phytocannabinoids. We have um, uh, uh, fully synthetic uh, cannabinoids. They, right. they don't look like cannabinoids, but they bind uh, the same receptor, and we're going to touch on that one in a second. The other one, uh, the family is a program that's at the moment a more sort of an R&D uh, way um, mm. phase. It's molecule, they have the structure, the backbone, if you want, of the phytocannabinoids, but they're modified to make them better. Uh, cannabinoids are notorious for being a bit difficult as a drug, right. you, drug product. So, so we're trying to modify them, make it that better. Um, um, so we, we have a sort of a, um, a differential approach to, to, to what we want to do, although the company is working, uh, particularly focusing in pain, mm. that is not to say that we may consider other therapeutic areas in, in yes. the patient, but in general, we refer to, we address pain, particularly pain that not the type of pain that is treatable, uh, by over the counter ibuprofen or paracetamol, uh, but actually by other type of pain, um, chronic pain or, or sharp pain uh, mm -hmm. that needs uh, to, that has a medical needs because not necessarily, despite effectively what people may think, uh, there's still uh, a lot of condition and a lot of people uh, that are not targeted by the drugs that are on the market. And, and yes, we can I open see. a whole discussion about that, about opioid, gabapentin, and so forth. So why, why cannabinoids? Well, obviously, cannabis has a long history, 5,000 years of history yeah. of, uh, of um, popular medicine. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, popular med medicine is based on something real. Uh, if it wouldn't work, people eventually will likely to stop using it, particularly uh, because the uh, cannabis I'm talking about, uh, the, the one that is used for medical reason, uh, is not high THC and low CBD. It's a ratio of more or less one to one. So right. yes, there is a psychotropic effect, but it's not as pronounced as the new uh, strains of cannabis that have 27 percent, 28 percent, or even higher THC, almost mm -hmm. non-existent CBD. Um, that is unfortunately a, a disaster waiting to happen, and in fact, it is happening. Uh, yeah. But um, but normally speaking, cannabis, uh, it's much more benign in terms of toxicology. It's much it's safer, uh, certainly safer than, than opioid in, in general by many other medicines. But mm -hmm. it works. Uh, it works in reducing uh, um, pain. It works in other indications as well, as we know, for example, um, um, epilepsy. And has been useful for, for that with data. There are sort of, uh, if you want, anecdotal, again, uh, people using it, but also more recently with a lot of work in terms of research in the lab, but also clinical trials. Yes. So we think that pain, uh, it's interesting for us because we know that cannabinoids and cannabis works in pain, but we also know that there is a large amount uh, need for, for treating pain. Uh, and again, serious pain, chronic pain, debilitating mm. Uh, that actually change uh, the style of uh, lifestyle and quality of life of people. Yeah. 
Yeah, interesting. All these compounds, they target, uh, obviously, as every drug, um, uh, receptors or if you mm-hmm. want system, uh, they already exist in our body. Uh, in this case, as you, as you mentioned, the endocannabinoid system. Um, the endocannabinoid system is a system made of receptor, protein, that do an enzyme, they do different activities, a ligand, of course, and these ligands are produced by our body. So our body yeah. produces cannabinoids effectively, okay. uh, whether we want it or not. Uh, and they're used for the homeo- what is called homeostasis. So basically, it's the balance between diff- in different uh, uh, biological systems about pros and cons and how to keep our work, uh, our body ticking. Mm. And in some situation, like in case of pain, uh, this um, sort of clockwork machine is going in the wrong direction. Pain is obviously a positive signal, despite uh, what everybody thinks. I mean, obviously, it's an alert signal. We need that. Yeah. We need to know if, for example, uh, we are putting our hands on a hot plate because yeah. we don't want to burn ourselves. Um, so we remove it quickly, and that's saving us. Uh, but what we're addressing, obviously, is the type of pain. Uh, that is caused by an imbalance of our body, but some situation that is caused by the outside or it's intrinsic to our body um, because our life changes because of an incident that happened. And in mm-hmm. this case, this balance is broken and we need to refix it. Yes. Uh, and one way, is, for example, is targeting the cannabinoids that we know have an uh, important uh, 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 role in, in analgesia. Mm. And in this case, we come with if you want exocannabinoids rather than endo, meaning pro, pro, uh, or phytocannabinoids, naturally speaking, that are this molecule that look like they mimic the cannabinoid that we are in our body. They bind the same receptor, they do the same activity, and they reconstitute mm-hmm. of the balance that we lost, if you want. Um, unfortunately, phytocannabinoids or cannabis, uh, they have some caveats. Uh, cannabis per se um, is kind of unreliable on the quality and so forth. Okay. The, the phytocannabinoids are not as good as as drug as one would 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 do probably would never be developed if uh, if it were discovered by chance in uh, through the mm. screening that normally uh, company do um but but they do work and so now we modify that we try to target the same receptor with something that is slightly different or completely different like our, yes uh, program one for example is uh, is a completely different molecule but it targets one receptor and we hope that that will reconstitute the balance that we have going over some of the issue that pain can cause. Yeah, interesting. So I suppose conceptually, if you remove all the hyperbole and, and yeah. misinformation and noise and all that kind of thing, I guess conceptually it's similar to, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that are trying to harness immune response, right? So, you know, sure. the immune system works. And so companies are looking at that and going, okay, so how do we get hold of that, make it better, make it more scalable, make it more useful as a therapeutic? Sure. I guess it's a similar thing that there is this, um, what has traditionally been popular medicine, folk yeah. remedy that that works but is imperfect. You're yeah. going okay, so there's something there. Let's yes. let's uncover what the essence of that is. Let's improve it. Let's make that a real sort of bona fide therapeutic prospect. Exactly. And yeah. and to be honest, a lot of the medicine out there. I mean, the 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 uh, sort of pure uh, ke- chemical or artificial dis- uh, drug discovery is relatively recent. If you. Mm. Um, it was starting when I was at uh, university or oh, all those days ago. Um, be, uh, before that, most of the company was still based on some initial research made with natural compound. It was yes. used for as drug. And then people were trying to uh, modify the, 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 the molecule so that to reduce the caveats. I mean, if you think, for example, a digitoxin that is used for, for treating some arrhythmia comes from digitalis purpurea. They were using mm-hmm. the the, the, the leaves, uh, they have issues of quality, amounts you can produce and so forth. So like they say, well, let's let's take a look at this and see if we can do it better. And that is exactly what we, we're trying to do with cannabinoids. You know, cannabis has been stigmatized uh, mm. for, for ages. Um, and one would, you know, is wondering why. Uh, because if you compare with another very well seemingly accepted uh, drugs, uh, drug um, uh, family uh, that are opioids, Mm. Um, it's a bit bizarre. I mean, uh, opioid causes cause war uh, in the yeah. past. They uh, created havoc in uh, in in some of the societies, like in China, for example. Um, completely destroyed the, the, the some you know thousands and thousands of families and certainly yes. hundreds of thousands of lives. And yet we use cannabinoid uh, opioid because they work mm-hmm. and they do to a certain extent. And we we can come back to that if you want. Yeah. Uh, cannabis. Um, I mean, smoking cannabis, it's, it's as caveat, of course. First of all, because you're smoking. 
uh, which is by default is in, in inhaling something and it's burned. Yeah. Uh, and even if you have these days the uh, uh, heat no burn devices, the vapes, if you want to call it, it's still a heating up a quite yes. high temperature. Yeah. Uh, the molecules, uh, so you're always bound to, to to inhale something that is not what it was. Mm -hmm. and that's what we get around. We uh, we are not smoking. We, are, for example, our phytocannabinoids program that is program through, it, it is inhalation, but it is inhalation through a PMDI. That is those right. devices that are used, for example, for asthma, right? Yeah. So we use a pharmaceutical device to deliver our our uh, compounds, our, our um, potential drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, uh, obviously there are risks to smoking cannabis, and yes, every time you put something in your body, it doesn't matter how good it is, you change your body, and that's not yeah. always positive. Uh, but effectively, the amount of people uh, that has have uh, sort of toxicity caused by cannabinoids, uh, it's is not that great. It's not that big. Certainly mm. not like opioid. Yeah. And if used uh, with you know, attention, that's what it should be for anything that you put in your body, as I say, any drug, uh, um, uh, any compound that you put in your body should be careful. You know, you, for example, very well, if you take certain vitamins and, and, and you put in your, if you pump it in your body, actually, you have a, a condition called hypervitaminosis, right. that is as bad and actually has the same symptoms sometimes of hypovitaminosis, so the lack of vitamins. So it's actually quite risky. So even vitamin, if you think, well, well it's very important, but yes, yeah, yeah. you have to be careful. So in this case, if we do, uh, so, so basically, the use of limited amount of cannabis is, is not, it's very limited in terms of, of uh, all the toxicity they can cause. Uh, in their non natural, as I said, I don't want to put, uh, portray this message, but they are certainly much less riskier than, uh, than opioid. And yet, everybody was against politician, people, everyone was against cannabis, uh, mm. or really no reason why, because it can work, and that's what we're trying to show. But you, you pointed out correctly. So we are starting from a natural product. We are not though using the natural product per se. Yes. We're trying to make it better. And we try to apply all best scientific and drug discovery and development processes that will allow us to tell us that our compa will be useful. And we're gonna go into the clinic and uh, well, some of past the clinic if you want, mm -hmm. only if it is actually having an, an efficacy. Obviously, you have to test that in human. Of course, course. yeah. Um and um and only of course, if it's safe. If for any other reason this is gonna, uh, you know, it's not gonna be uh, accepted for us mm -hmm. uh, and, and by the regulator, by the way. Uh, but we have highly standard and uh, we, we're very stringent when it comes to to our uh, safety uh, yes. requirements. So again, we will do our our best to prove that cannabinoids have a space uh, in in uh, in uh, as a therapeutic can work and can be actually safe to to use. Yeah, it makes total sense. Um, and the other thing I was interested in from yep. from what you said in describing the business actually was yep. uh, you mentioned that the company went public last year. Yes. Um, and so you're the chief scientific officer. Yep. I was interested in how your role is different today than it was pre-listing, and yes. and what 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 it what is the role of a chief scientific officer in a public company, and where do you spend your time primarily? Yes. Um... My role as a CSO is more or less uh, the same as, uh, okay. as, as it would have been before, um, because uh, I'm not a CFO, I'm not a CEO, I'm not a mm -hmm. CEO, and thank God for that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I'm interested in science. But there is an interesting aspect uh, that I actually quite enjoy, and and it is the the discussion with uh, with investor. Obviously, we have mm. investor now. They're not necessarily scientists. They're yeah. not necessarily people that are involved in the generally speaking in a pharmaceutical environment. So for me, it's important to guide them to understand what we do, uh, explain our model, and why things are maybe uh, not always as an investor would like to 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 be. Mm. Uh, you know, we are a company, a pharmaceutical company, and yeah. uh, and we are not generating uh, revenues um, in, per se. Uh, but if we will, and when we will, and I'm sure we will, um, that would be you know a really good revenue, <laughs> a really good mm -hmm. investment. But you need to have uh, patience. And yes. uh, and and the discussion for me with my role with uh, with investors try to explain. Um, sometimes in late terms, or sometimes more specific, uh, the science behind what we do, why we're doing things that are, let's face it, long and expensive, mm -hmm. uh, but they must be done in that way. Uh, because again, if you want to do as we want, and we always say this, we, we put the patient in our center. I I always start one of my presentation uh, with a with a picture of um, 
we refer to sometimes the blue man uh, okay. the city of is blue it's uh, is to show uh, this is also have a, a scientific reason it's we we show the distribution of the receptor but the point is that that is the patient represent the patient it mm -hmm. is at the center of what we do and you cannot take shortcut you can accelerate no. by implementing uh, activities to improve your your the way you work but you yes. cannot take shortcuts um and when you run into an issue uh you need to address that yeah. because again you don't want to be one day and it is happening it happened in the past it is happening these days uh that drug they are in the market and are considered extremely successful actually they're not that safe as people would like to say uh, and if you go and start digging into the result uh, you see why, uh, yes. but so so we don't want to do that. We don't want to be you know, in ten years' time. I don't want to be the guy that uh, overlooked some important uh, uh, scientific data that were suggesting that the, uh, you you may have a, a side effect. Now, having said that, I mean side effects. As I said, any anything you put in your body has yeah. a side effect, right? Uh, but but it, you have to take it carefully, and you have to evaluate when the side effects are such that are you know, uh, are counterbalanced by the high benefit that the drug yes. can do. And this is my job, effectively, yes. uh, to check whether, uh, even if there is something, uh, is not dangerous and uh, it's certainly justified by by the effect. No, I understand. Um, and it's it's good to hear that you've, you've uh, kept science at the core. I think that's yes. probably a bit of a fear of a lot of people in your position when companies go through that transition is does... Does that change? But it's good to hear that that hasn't. Um, there, no, there, there is a change. I mean, I guess as you said, I mean, I do spend more time talking yes. to not necessarily uh, outside investor, uh, but inside investor, so to speak, existing. Uh, let's call I call them partner uh, or collaborator because that's that's what they do. They're supporting us in what what we do with in different way. In this case, with with, with their uh, inputs, but we, we that's what we do, mm -hmm. and it is important to discuss this. So normally you have. Um, you know, company meeting where you talk about the science, where you talk about some of the organizations, some of the difficulties. In this case, we just extend that, and we had another layer, another layer of individual. They are informed. Uh, they are the um, the the investor. Uh, yes. For me, uh, if you want, I have to more careful, be more careful what I say, <laughs> uh, because uh, PLC are are regulated yeah. uh, by the financial authorities. And everything I say, uh, whether it is good or bad, uh, has to be justified. Uh, not that I would try to say something not justified, but you, you have to be careful, and because it is so sensitive, and um, yeah, it, yeah. it does add an extra level of stress if you want in that direction. But we are, I'm, a, you know, as I say, my colleagues are great. Uh, they take on board most of the activities linked mm. to that type of activities, uh, financial and uh, regulatory, uh, as in financial regulatory or, or organizational. And I can focus on uh, on running um, the science uh, and make sure that all the experiments that we do are run properly. Yes. And and they give the answer that we want to. Yes, makes sense. And I'm always interested, Valentino, in the the path that people have taken to get to where they are today. So sure, so yes. we've talked a bit about today, but I want to take it back to back to the very beginning. If my if my research is correct, and apologies if it's not, you're a medicinal yeah. chemist originally. Originally, yes, yes, yes I am. I am. Uh, I did medicinal chemistry uh, university in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for that was the the particular faculty I, I attended was a nice mixture uh, of chemistry and biology. So a medicinal a chemist uh, will mostly focus just on the molecule, just on the chemistry as yes. such. Medicinal chemistry comes in with other type of of uh, interest, if you want, uh, uh, pharmacology, biology, mm -hmm. microbiology. Um, I did any of the, I did actually um, one of my um, uh, courses was about the chemistry of food. Uh, okay. So, I learn how to do olive oil, so to speak, but yeah. uh, what olive oil means, extra virgin, virgin, and so forth. So quite quite interesting. But the reason why I went into that direction is that I had two poles. On one side, I had the chemistry, the knowledge of how the molecules are done and, 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 and developed. And on the other is the, the knowledge of, of the biology and on the pharmacology behind it. And I always wanted to be a scientist um, mm -hmm. from, from as basically from when I was a kid. And and by growing, I realized by doing this, I would basically take a lot in, 
uh, but uh, maybe not very specific, not a pure chemist nor a pure biologist, but yes. so, so, so someone interfaced that well allowed to develop my, my career in helping uh, people. Because at the end of the day, I think most of the scientists, certainly scientists in uh, medical medicine is obviously the, again, the aim is the patient, mm -hmm. which just explains some of my development. Because although it, int it is interesting, uh, sitting on the side of the bench, doing experiments, uh, inventing things, if you want, from, from scratches, um, the reality is at one point you realize that what you do has to be aimed to something higher yes. than just pure science, uh, which is obviously science is interesting. Any any uh, knowledge, new knowledge may be used in the future. Uh, you don't know. Um, but I, I wanted to be closer to the to the to the patient. In mm. addition, uh, I was a better biologist than a chemist, uh, so <laughs> so I change. Uh, I, I I set my career going in that path. Obviously, not in chem pure chemistry. Yes, no, I see, I see. So t so tell us a bit about that then. So so you you were in Milan. Yeah. Um, got your PhD. Yes. Um, and then headed out to what is ne was now differently named as the Crick, but um, back then was the National Institute for. Um, uh, for, for medical uh, research. For medical Asia, research, that's it, yes. For medical research, yes. Before that, I had a spell at, um, in the United States at the, the another great institution that is the, the NIH, the National Institute yes. of Yes, okay, Health. yeah, yeah. That is um, a, a bit like the NIMR. Um, it's a basically uh, a publicly funded uh, organiz research organization. Um, and the NIH is, uh, I would say, uh, the, the largest research organization in the world. Uh, they have in what they call intramural activity means actually lab and people doing research internally, and then they have mm -hmm. a lot of funding, a bit like the MRC, effectively, uh, yes. in larger scales because the United States have uh, high investments in science. Of course, yeah. Uh, we were based near Washington, and um, and you had often politicians coming in, mm -hmm. um, and also celebrities because obviously they were, um, you know, lobbying for for research in particular area. Right. Uh, I was there, and I'm, now I'm telling my age, but I was there during the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether you like Clinton or not, and I'm not trying to say be political, but it did invest a lot in science. Right. Uh, and uh, there was the time where they, they opened a completely new building for, for a vaccine and another building for HIV research only. So mm -hmm. real investment in something that is topical and what, that the public wants. Uh, that is, I think they, you know, the public as a whole may have a... Um, you know, maybe not specific, but certainly overall understanding of what a community needs, uh, and they push for that. Yes. And I think that is that is important, and um, and that's so. The NIH was a great opportunity. We have uh, uh, great scientists, a lot of Nobel Prize that were going around the mm -hmm. campus, um, and it was a great um, opportunity. And then uh, I decided to sort of getting uh, a bit closer to home. Uh, at least it was Italy at the time. Yes. And 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 came to the UK. That has now have become my home because uh, everything I have is now here. My family mm -hmm. and so forth. My, my wife is Italian, but uh, my son is uh, proudly British and uh, okay. and um, a, a rugby player and supporting England, <laughs> <laughs> which makes it makes an interesting thing when England plays Italy. Yes, uh, I'm sure. Six, uh, two different rooms, two different set of television. Yes. But, so I came to UK uh, because I had the opportunity to to work in a great uh, lab. It was uh, Rosa Moiska's lab at the NIMR. Um, they were working in immunology, as I was in the States. Um, particularly in that case was um, uh, cell signaling, how uh, the, the, the signal that coming from the outside, whether from mm. the world or from through, uh, through our body into the cells, if you want, affect the immune system. Uh, that you mentioned before, and, and um, I, I said that from biological point of view, I'm more an immunologist, if you want, historically right. speaking. And I was doing it. So what happened when something quote unquote, hit the cells and what happened inside, why the cells react in a certain way. Um, and, and, and sort of those years of my career, both at the NIH and, uh, and NMR, was to try to understand the inside of the cells and how the inside then can affect what's happening outside. Yes. Uh, either, for example, I was working with mast cells. Mast cells are the cells that uh, are involved, for example, in um, allergic reaction um, and or in asthma. Uh, although they do obviously positive things like reacting against mm -hmm. and show um, 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 microbes that, that come in, uh, obviously. So it's it's a first line of descent, what is called innate immunity. They they, yes. they, they are the f really first and quick uh, line of defense. And again, those uh, can go wrong uh, and understanding how they work is important, um, both in terms of their role as an immune cells, um, 
on one side, but like when I was doing the work with the T cell, also to understand uh, some of the uh, implication in oncology, because as you know, the, um, some type of um, uh, leukemia are characterized by T cell uh, expansion, uh, well, mutation and expansion. So mm. that was also important for us. Um, and IMR is was a fantastic institute. It, it yes. still is uh, as a Crick. Um, and um, it was, was really the, the amount of uh, great scientists uh, from the UK uh, and from abroad as well. Mm. Uh, it was unbelievable. Um, and it was certainly useful for, for, for to shape my, my, my career. Uh, you are really understanding of the science. And I, and I, I know that the creek is still going in that direction. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, perhaps in a bizarre location, if you want central London, not, not exactly <laughs> very... Uh, easy to 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 sort of um, for for a scientist, particularly students that don't have much money, and commuting it costs a lot. Uh, but but what it does is actually put the uh, research in the middle, of, if you want, of That's true. London. Yeah. And um, no offense to anybody, but in the middle of uh, at least England, should we say? Uh, and and so it is important that mm. that is there. It's visible. And accessible from, of course, from from all over the world in Europe and, and the United States as well. So, and, and they're doing a great job. Yeah, and and you've touched on this yourself, but um, both between NIMR and and the NIH, it must be a fabulous place to start your career as a researcher. As you said, surrounded by Nobel Prize winners and people yeah. who who have really achieved as as scientists and researchers who've done some really it, important things. It is, it is, it is uh, a uh, an humbling uh, um, experience, mm. but it's certainly useful. I mean, I've, scientists are a bit peculiar uh, <laughs> uh, as 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 individual, right? Um, and um, but they, like in every uh, part of society, you have the nice guys and not the not so nice guys. Sure. Uh, but but having said that, my experience is mostly linked with uh, you know when we're talking about the Nobel Prize. What I when I was at the NIH, I I started this. Uh, you know, immunology course, and um, and I went in, and there was all young scientists like like myself coming from you know Japan, China, mm -hmm. um, South America, Europe, uh, Africa, Israel, and uh, India, and we were all there, and uh, and the doors open, and uh, a Nobel Prize came in to give you a lecture about immunology. You know, that's that's you you feel yeah. special, you feel special yes. yourself, and it certainly give you motivation. And um, and and we have some obviously uh, there was a call, but we had lectures, and at one point there were three Nobel Prize in the in the, in the room, uh, all three on the, uh, one point on the, next to the to the speaker's uh, um, uh, desk. So so it, it was it was really it, it gives you motivation. Uh, yes. It gives you motivation. You, I I like to to mention sometimes uh, Andy Whitty used to be uh, the. Uh, CEO of uh, GlaxoSmithKline, mm -hmm. uh, where I worked for for a few years, and he and he said something really interesting um, um, about the reason why some of should work for a company, um, and I guess he had some grudge against some of the high flyers, so to speak. But um, uh, we we're talking about the scientist. He said that the scientist um, they work on things that they cannot see. Uh, and it's true. Right. Uh, a lot of time, unless you have a very powerful microscope and a yeah, very expensive yeah. one, you don't see it. And let's face it, uh, things that probably will will never work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yet, and yet they keep going. Uh, and being a scientist, you know, I think that you know people say, "Oh, you're a, you know, scientists must be in, you know smart and must be flexible and everything." I think resilience is uh, is mm. the important. Um, Characteristic of a scientist because you're bound to to be surprised negatively by your results more yes. uh, than the positive one. But when you get the positive, that where that's where your brain starts working even more, and that's what you you understand that you can actually help people. Uh, and although you know you know drug discovery goes start with 100 and ends up with one, that's why I say most of the time will never work. Mm -hmm. But that one, uh, it actually improves lives, and Basically, and 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 and, yeah. and you we need to think uh, about the public money and private money spent into science uh, to benefit the public, uh, and and we need to go in that direction all the time. No, absolutely. No, I, I agree with you. I think you know inherently, you have to be, you have to have a really thick skin and a really clear sense of purpose to work on something that you know. In, in which you know that most of what you do, the vast majority of what you do, isn't going to work. 
No. Yeah. Um, but exactly. you've got to get through those things to find a thing that does. Yes. Um, um, it's I, I sometimes do. Um, so you, you, you look at the great scientists uh, in the past, and they were revolutionary in, in, in their way as well. Uh, but they were so great that I discovered uh, a lot of things. Mm. Uh, and, um, and sometimes uh, discussing with some, some of my fellow scientists is like, you know, if it was easy to discover, somebody would have discovered it already. Um, That's true, yeah. You know, um, so now we are here doing research, uh, trying to find in something that was even more hidden than <laughs> Then, then you think uh, they cannot be discovered. We have much more technology available to us, mm -hmm. uh, much more knowledge. We can share in our knowledge. We can process an incredible amounts of data. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all about an hypothesis and yeah. trying to prove it right. And it's becoming more difficult. And um, some people say, well, it costs a lot of money. Is it good spending public money there? Is, is, is it, you know, why do we have to spend so much? And, mm -hmm. and, I, and again, if I can do a, an example, we're thinking about a fast car. Again, again I hope uh, people don't, don't get offended if I mention one and not the other. But so you can buy a Ferrari. It's a quite expensive car and you can go really fast with it. But if you really, really want to go fast, you need to buy a Bugatti that costs mm -hmm. much more. And the reason for that is that it's easy to, to have a car, relatively easy, that goes at 200 uh, and 20 miles an hour. Uh, but then going from 220 to 250 it is only 30 miles. Then that is where the yes. big thing comes in. And then you have to put redundancy, what you have to put special, um, you know, double engine and so forth and so forth. So what happened is that you can spend not so much, so to speak, uh, to go to 220. But if you go to 250, you need to spend a lot more. Yeah, and absolutely. where science is, we are going 220 now. And we want to, to go to 250. And that's why we have to, pay, to put more money because there's still a lot that we need to discover. Yeah. It's a, it's a good way to look at it, I suppose. Each each percentage point improvement gets yes. more and more expensive. More and more expensive. More yeah. and more difficult and more and more expensive. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I was interested in, Valentino, and we'll talk a bit more, well, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a bit more about the rest of your career as well. Yeah. <laughs> <But> <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> something you said about sort of your your transition from chemistry to biology yes. and... and, and I was interested if, and this may not be something you've thought about, or it may be something you've thought about a lot. It may be a hard question to answer. I'm not sure. But um, do you think that your chemistry training means that you look at biological problems a little differently than someone who's a died in the wool biologist? Yes, yes, I did. Yes, mm. it, uh, it did. Um, because, um, first of all, it'll allow me actually to, I mean, I'm not a chemist. If if I had to say I'm not a chemist, but I can talk to chemists right. uh, and try to understand their perspective. Um, and when they come to, to see me about issues, and I try to discuss that, uh, and if they mention something, you know, I understand what it is. But what I what I uh, learned back then and and through my career uh, when I had to deal with small molecule and, and the way they interact with the body is that. You know, there is a relationship of how the molecule looks like and the way it works. Uh, and very similar molecule work in a different way. Mm. I can give an example of our phytocannabinoids, and you start with a molecule that, for example, is, is like a THC molecule, and you yeah. change one side of the molecule, and it does exactly what THC does. Uh, you change the other one, and it stops being THC-like. Mm -hmm. And understanding that is important, because I, I actually, sadly, <laughs> met scientists uh, uh, that, during a presentation, they say, well, these molecules look a bit like the other molecules, so certainly it's going to do the same. And um, and that shows, actually, they don't understand chemistry, they don't understand see, yeah. the relationship between the structure of the molecule, the chemistry of the molecule, the way it looks, uh, and the, what it does. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking a bit like doesn't give you anywhere. You need to look exactly like, or do yes. exactly the same thing, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, but also, I, uh, I think uh, we're talking about safety that is always paramount. It's uh, it's uh, what I did understand is that um, the way you synthesize molecule, obviously you synthesize the molecule that you want, but you always come up with something else, uh, and that is also extremely important because mm -hmm. it might be zero point zero percent, but if it does the wrong thing then you are uh, going to have create havoc in an individual. And so understanding that the chemistry is important, not just because it gives you the drug, but also because you have to work it out so that it's not dangerous and all and all the work behind it to sort of clean, quote, 
to, to speak, uh, your product is, is very, very important. Mm. Uh, and uh, some side effects are not side effect at all. Actually, generally, the, the, the definition of side effect, although uh, it appears to the public, and I sometimes use it, it's actually not right. It's an unwanted effect. Right. Uh, normally, the side effects are caused by the molecule for what it does. Yes. So it's active, and therefore, you have the good thing, but unfortunately, a bit of the bad things as well. Right. Um, the side effect, generally speaking, caused uh, by something that shouldn't be there, but and it is there, and that is also very important. Yes. And the other aspect I understood at the time uh, is that just because you have a molecule, uh, like people talking drug, but drug is only one actually on the market, really, a potential drug or a molecule that is very active, um, even, even if it is safe and, and efficacious, mm. uh, you cannot treat people with one gram of that. You need right. to generate kilos, uh, yes. hundreds of kilos or tons when it comes to a certain drug that are on the market, of course. And that's when chemistry is important because mm. if you have something that works, but you cannot produce it, you're back to square zero. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, so certainly it helped me to look at the biology with a different eye and, and try to understand more uh, how important the chemistry is. Yes. Yeah. No, it's interesting. And so, so revisiting your career. So, so you're at NIMR for for several years, and then yep. um, and move into industry at that point. And yep. was that you mentioned keeping the patient at the center yep. of your thing? Was, was that behind that move? Do you think? Yeah. Or, yeah Basically, okay. yes. Yes. Uh, sometimes we, uh, uh, among, among scientists, you have the joke: we are not in the business of treating um, mice. Yes. Um, now, interestingly enough, if I may open a, 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 a sort of parenthesis, is that um, veterinary science is extremely interesting as well. Mm -hmm. And understanding how we can help animals is also important, uh, particularly the ones that are closer to us. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, either for other reasons, uh, you know, food industry, you need to have a healthy animal, uh, but also for our friends, our pets. I mean, our, we, we need to keep them. So, so there is an interesting aspect of uh, yes. animal science as well. But in general, what we aim in, of course, is, is to, to study uh, the human. And, and for me, um, again, as I say, every piece of information uh, is important. And you never know uh, a, a relatively obscure paper published in the 60s may come back and, and bite in a way, in a good way, mm. uh, finding good discovery. I, I was trying to use an example that is not in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, necessarily in medicinal science. It was a, a Russian scientist that, that was working about uh, radio um, 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 so, um, frequencies, and, yes. and he discovered that uh, with um, spiky edges, so to speak, triangles and so forth, um, the, the the waves uh, were not reflected in the in the back to 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 where it was coming from, and that was completely forgotten until people thought, oh, one second, maybe we can do a stealth airplane with it, and that's why the stealth airplane has or at least the first generation of all those. Mm. A triangle shaped things because basically they divert their, their radio uh, inputs or the frequencies, should we say, um, electromagnetic frequencies are up rather than down back yeah, to the radar. So, again, this was a paper I think was published in the 20s or early 30s, and, and, and it was at the base of research that's been done in the 70s or applying in the 90s, really. <laughs> Sorry. So, it's a um, it's really interesting. So, so you mm. never know when your science is going to come back. Um, and um, but myself, I I, I was working uh, at the at the NIH, and uh, and I uh, almost found a serendipitous uh, uh, finding, uh, which um, I thought originally was due to the fact that I messed up with experiments. Um, okay, it was so totally unexpected that I think I inverted the sample. Uh, the second time it happened again, so I said, well, maybe not. it's not a coincidence, or maybe it's not me. And it actually wasn't me. It was the real science. And, and I discovered um, basically that, that, that the, a particular molecule, a protein, it was present in, in a cell that was not supposed to be there. Mm. Uh, and so, or at least that's what scientists said, uh, and they were wrong. Um, and um, he actually, the way it was working, explained why. Um, about 100 different type of drugs targeting specific kinases didn't work. Okay. So, yes, I mean it's negative if you want, uh, but it actually was completely novel, and uh, it made me, you know, really proud if you want. Uh, mm. if I can say that, uh, but also it explained science. It explained yes. why things were not working. Uh, so you never know. 
Uh, but at one point, as I said, in this process of understanding and, and you know, uh, applying your science and learning for your things, you, you start thinking, why have I started in the first place? Right, yes. Um, you know, and, and again, I want to, to make a drug. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why I did medicinal chemistry in the first place, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so I decided to, to move to a company to be more uh, closer, to have a different approach to the work that is sometimes perhaps a bit more um, repetitive and more, more mm -hmm. but more direct uh, and more focused on, on the final aim um, to actually make the drug. Yeah. And that was also obviously extremely important for, for my development. Uh, yes. And wide opening, I, I open it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, so you moved on to GSK. Um, I'm sure, you know, you've touched on um, sort of your experiences there briefly. Um, and then I suppose that, you know, obviously large organization, um, lots of resource, lots of different programs, lots of things to get involved in, although I know you would have been focused on on specific areas. Um, and then that led to a move into a much smaller organization um, yes. <clears throat> further down the line. And so I, I suppose that's then the transition to where you are today. So so tell us a bit about, I guess, the the key learning moments at GSK and then that transition into biotech and, and your experience of that. Sure. I mean, GSK, like like other uh, from large pharmaceutical company, I worked briefly at Roche when I was uh, still in Italy. Was, mm -hmm. You know, uh, sort of transition from 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 my postdoc position and uh, and, and and to to the future. While I frankly I was waiting to do my initial service that I had to do because it was mandatory at the time right. in Italy. Um, that was actually quite interesting as well from the personal point of view. Uh, it wasn't military, uh, but social services. So it was very interesting. Okay. Yeah. But um, so I, I, I worked for Roche and worked for, um, although it was a small lab in Roche, uh, mm -hmm. GSK and I'm sure other company like, like that, uh, they have, as you said, incredible potential. Uh, and uh, if you're a bit like me, that as you can see, I can I like talking to, to, to people. Um, <laughs> you got to know a few people around and a lot yeah. of people around. And, and again, you have really all the information you need on your fingertip. You know, you're... Um, you don't know about one thing, you know who to go and ask. Yes. Uh, you you forgot to order a reagent. You know who's going to get the reagent for uh -huh. you, uh, and, and then you, you buy it back uh, the next week. So it's – and the knowledge, the, the capabilities are incredible. Um, uh, but however, like large companies, and they, they do suffer a bit of uh, gigantism, if you want. Mm. Um, and um, there are some aspects that are not as good. Um and, and one of that, if you want for the personal point of view, although, again, you understand that you're making the difference because without your job, the job could not progress further. Yes. Is it, it, you are, uh, in a way, at least at the beginning of your career, uh, a small um, entity. Uh, oh, and yes. uh, and you'll be forgotten, effectively. All your work, uh, gone, you have to handle over to somebody else. Uh, they will take it and... And um, and will grow uh, mm -hmm. your child, so to speak, to to get married and so forth and so forth. Yeah. Um, so so at that point, after a few years, I, I thought I learned enough to try to be more impactful directly, so to speak, and and, and have more to say on what I had to do on a daily basis. And working in a small company was certainly um, was certainly a, uh, the, the move that I wanted to do. But having mm -hmm. said that, uh, again, working for GSK, it it, done, it did put me uh, in contact with the first experience of uh, sort of a molecular work with that went into human. And again, it really uh, makes you bond to your science more. And, and that's why I said the next step actually was for a company that had a molecule that was going into clinic. So it would have been even more uh, direct contact um, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and and I, and I wanted to move, and I, and I moved to Casius. Um, there was a, an, an interesting um, <clears throat> situation uh, because um, the when we started working, uh, we realized that the molecule was not as good as people were thinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and uh, for different reason, uh, but uh, but we did a good work, uh, I suppose, because we, you know. It, Science is, is it gives you a negative result. Uh, mm -hmm. In your in your responsibility as a scientist, and again, GSK was quite clear to that, is that when you're sitting on a negative result, 
you cannot just forget about it. Uh, right. When you are in the lab in a, and you're working with certain type of science that is not going somewhere uh, directly to the patient, so to speak, then you, you have the luxury to say, it didn't work. I, I was wrong. I do something else. Mm. When you're working uh, with a potential drug, you cannot do that. You have the, the duty and the responsibility to figure it out why it's not working. Sure. And and if the the, the drug is almost going to the, uh, to the clinic or is already there, uh, you need actually to sit down and understand very well because it will be more difficult to convince people that you, they need to stop. Mm-hmm. But you have the duty to do that. You can you're if you find something that is not working, you are not allowed, you know, morally and practically and legally, to be honest, but to continue <laughs> and do things that yes. are wrong. Um, but some people like to to walk on uh, on the on the gray line, and and I, I was lucky to meet people always in my career, GSK, Kansas, and, and Gamma Delta, which they were quite clear about the responsibilities, the personal responsibilities that you have towards the your. Uh, "Quote unquote customer," that is your mm. patient eventually, and uh, and your business can work only if you keep in the patient as your cherished customer. Yes, um, unfortunately, uh, short short term benefits. Oh, I can go into the clinical trial, or I can go through the first clinical trial, um, and then hoping that eventually it doesn't matter if it works or not because your career is moving on forward. Mm. Um, is not the approach people should take. And, and no. I was lucky to work with people that never use that approach. So. Yeah, I suppose it's, everybody is is inherently self-interested to an extent, right? And it, it's managing yes. that, isn't it? It's, it's being cognizant of the big picture of what you're trying to achieve and, and not yes. just what you're trying to achieve, but what collectively yeah. we, as we, you, team, you, yes. as a business, as, a, exactly. as an industry, you're trying to achieve. Yes, I mean you. There, you, you have you know how many thousands of of biotech um, that go on for for years. And again, sometimes you know there are examples uh, of biotech that struggle for years, and then they 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 found exactly what was set to 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 yeah. find. And you think, wow, that was resilience, and that certainly was worth going through. Uh, but in some cases, it almost looked like. Uh, there are people sort of pushing to the next level just because that's and that's that's something that um, uh, you know uh, unfortunately yeah there is it's it's a bit like and I don't want to sort of uh, uh, add insult to injuries but you know when you go back to the to the crisis of the banking system mm-hmm. where everybody was thinking it was a great idea to give 110 percent mortgages at one point uh, no it was not a good idea they yeah. knew it was not a good idea uh, it did. Do a service to them uh, and to a certain extent to their department and to their company, and then is that the disaster happened. Yes, uh, that is money uh, that affected a lot of people, unfortunately. Uh, but here we're talking about the um, you know the health of individuals, mm. so we mm. cannot we cannot be do, doing like no. that. We need to no. have a certain standard. No, absolutely. Um, and then so. You know, whistle stop tour through through the rest of your career. So from Kitios yeah. to Gamma Delta, then yeah. then to OCT. Yeah, I suppose I'm really, and you've touched on some of this already, Valentino. But um, I suppose what I'm really interested in is looking back on that that journey that you've taken so far. There's obviously more more to come. Yeah, um, awesome. but looking back on <laughs> looking back on so far, you know, if there were things that you would point to as the key career lessons for you, or, or I guess things that you wish you'd known when you were starting out uh, in this yep. on this path. Are there a couple of things that you would point to that have been really key development points for you? Well, interestingly enough, um, if we go really back in time, and then we we touch probably be more sort of recent lesson. But um, you know, I I I was at one point I had to make a decision where I want to become a medical doctor. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I wanted to 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 help people and and whether to become a scientist and I yeah. thought actually I probably enjoy more science, uh, um, but you know we were talking about the, the importance of understanding chemistry and biology together. I suppose uh, as a medical doctor would added an extra layer uh, of uh, of knowledge that is direct contact with the patient. I did have it a bit when I did the initial service as I said I was talking to people. They were, they were either at the beginning of, uh, fortunately, a journey through, through, through uh, cancer or, or, or in the middle of it. 
And uh, unfortunately, I saw some successful stories, so that's, that was great. Um, but that would have given me further uh, sort of input and understanding of uh, of uh, of what it takes to do science. And I, and I and I have to say, if someone wants to, if I had to, to give my six pence of, <laughs> of advice is that if someone wants to start a, a a career in science, actually doing me- um, medical school is not bad at all. Uh, right. It's it's great, and then you can go back to science yeah. as a as a medical doctor and do the research. And at the NIH, that was clear. There was a lot of um, uh, my boss was a was a biologist, uh, uh, but a lot of the individuals that were doing really cool and uh, and also interesting science uh, were medical doctor. Uh, that and some of them they were still actually doing the rounds within the right. NIH. Uh, that I thought it was great because you really you know everybody uses a punchline from bench to bed. Um, in that in their case, actually, that's what they were doing. Yes. Uh, so that would be that that was uh, an interesting understanding, but I couldn't change that. Um, although having said that, one of my professor um, at university, um, I finished my exam, my test. Uh, it wasn't that, one of my best, I should say. Uh, and he looked at me and, I, and he said, can, can I be honest with you? Yes, yeah, so yeah, forget about chemistry, go and do medicine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably he was right, but there you are. Um, <laughs> but as I said, I learned a few things. No, the, 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 as, as I said, the, the key understanding for me uh, uh, across my career, and again, for scientists, they, 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 they are starting the, their career and they want to, to go, is uh, always look uh, to the future. Mm. Do what you have to do now. Uh, but always think about the future, mm. uh, because um, in my career, I sometimes insisted to do things in a, just because they were interesting, right? Um, and and they were, uh, and they gave me nice uh, papers and, and and so forth, satisfaction, personal satisfaction. But again, look always at the future and be ready to challenge yourself. Um, I I you know I come from my my dad. Um, uh, sadly passed away a few 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 weeks ago, but he, he worked for the same company uh, for 25 years. Mm. Um, still still worker, um, and um, and I, I suppose I grew up with that idea that you need to stay in a company for a long time in order to be successful, and that's not the case. Yes, and particularly when you're you becoming your uh, role becoming more and more important, you see that you understand what is your role is and where you can give an input and. Um, mm. And for small company, for example, what happens is that the company evolves, uh, and uh, you start with a role. You are the most important, most important people in the company, uh, and when, because of your success, um, somebody else is becoming the most important right. person in the company. So you need to reinvent yourself, and you can do it within the company, if yes. looking for another project, or you uh, you start and you can look and uh, for. Uh, other project outside, if uh, in different areas, because once, although uh, the world uh, and science as well, it's given a lot of attention to um, a specific knowledge and, and building a, a great deal of understanding one specific area. Then, then actually, what the risk is that you miss the bigger picture. Sure. So my career yeah. has been, you know, uh, one way. Even argue what, what is the common link between your career exactly uh, because you you started medicinal chemistry you decided to become a biologist you work in microbiology virus and then you start working on allergy and immune cells and and then oncology and in uh, our pain why uh, and the reason is that to challenge yourself to, mm. to, to try to find new things and to go for innovation and i think that's what every scientist should should, should strive for do innovation what what you're doing have success and then think about something else and, and, and be innovative in that direction as well and be successful in that way. That's the, you know, it gives you more, more chance to, to have success and again, to reach the final goal that is helping people. Absolutely. Well, Valentino, thank you so much for sharing your career journey with us. We, we really appreciate it. Um, no, thank you for giving me this chance. It's uh it's nice to 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 look back in memories and actually thinking yes. that everything <laughs> had a reason at one point in your career. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much. No, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Careers in Discovery. And don't forget to subscribe for more insight into the world of drug discovery and R&D. Do take a look at our sponsors, Singular Talent, 
and their mission to make hiring better for companies and individuals in drug discovery and R&D. You can find them at www.singulartalent.io. See you next time.